Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Cheap vs. Real Episode 7. I'm Demon Sword, and, you know, it's been a long time coming for this video. So before you use my Ujifusa, there's a long, drawn-out, you know, I could, investigation I did, as well as involving Japanese NBTHK, and the head of the Japanese NBTHK at the time, I don't know if it's changed, but it's been about a year since I discovered the background of this blade, found out the blade's actually Tamahagane, it's put into my family's name, it's a Showa, it's a Showa sword, which when translated to what it was, it means Showato. Um, it's an Ujifusa, that's the smith. It was made by the third Ujifusa of the line, who died during World War II. So, big investigation into this blade. This sword is actually what got me into katanas, got me into involved in learning all the details. And basically, what this blade is what started Demon Sword. The channel, everything. So... It was really fun f finding out all this info on the blade last year. I kind of was waiting to surprise everybody with it. So, let's get into the details. This is a Maru sword, forged in Japan, basic geometry of the Japanese blade. Mino Smith, meaning it's an average sword smith. He's not the greatest, he's not the worst. He's a normal guy, you know. Normal. But, even in World War II, using that steel is kind of thing. Now, let's give you some feedback. What is Tamahagane? That steel that everybody flips out about and goes into so much depth, I just want to smack them. Tamahagane is equivalent to T10 steel, which is the China steel, and as well as American 1095. The American 1095 and T10 are roughly equivalent. There's actually a little more silicon and magnesium in the T10 in China, but they're two different standards, but they're roughly equivalent. They are equivalent to Tamahagane. Tamahagane is a primitive way to create well-forged, oh god, I was going to sneeze right there, uh, well-forged steel out of, it gets rid of a lot of impurities, but Tamahagane, using Tatara Forge, to create it, it's very labor-intensive, it's very dangerous, a lot of things can go wrong, and it only produces small amounts of Tamahagane. So, Select smiths get it. Only a few smiths get to work at the time, and they only have so much ore to work with, okay? So there's your basics into Tatara Forge, as well as Tamahagane. This I'm going to be using as my control sword. This is the basic. We're going to see how other swords compare in shape, geometry, and such to it. Now, most modern blades are forged with the thought of bigger, taller people. This was made for a Japanese man. I am a... <laughs> Caucasian. <laughs> I'm a little taller. I'm six foot one. I've got really long arms, long fingers. So most this blade actually feels like a um, wakazaki to me. It's a, it feels like a short sword, even though this is actually what they would usually use. Now, comparing with this Maru, we'll lay down next to it, roughly equivalently, the sword that is from Skyjiro Forge, made by David Goldberg, aka Kinzen. This is the Hanabira, which is means um, falling flower petals. Yes, it's a very pretty name description, Hanabira. It's got silvered parts, which you know I have a weakness for silver parts. This blade itself actually only cost me $3.95 total to get. And when I initially got it, I gave every one of my subscribers the opportunity to purchase from the same link, same cost deduction when it was first introduced by Skyjiro. <coughs> This is what they call their foot soldier line. It's been a really great sword. It is designed to go into medium and even to starting heavy targets. FYI, the fabric this is all resting on is real silk. If anybody wanted to know that. Um, it was a gift from my uncle years back. When he went to either China or Japan. I think it was China though. Now, as you can already tell from the difference between these two blades, this one's a lot longer. That's a 29 inch length blade. So it's a few inches taller than the standard. The other thing you'll notice is the Kasaki tip is actually a little elongated. And I actually really, really like longer Kasakis because it reduces weight if it's a shorter sword. But if it's a longer sword, it gives you that little more length to cut, a little more curvature, which is a little more helpful than you think in Ido. But take that as you will. Um, now, I touch my swords a lot in my videos. Please do not freak out because I do clean all the swords after the videos. 
Now, this is a Choji Haman, clay tempered. Choji Haman means this sword was dumped into Choji oil. The oil then is set on fire, makes this cool effect. It's, it's a pretty cosmetic, but it actually helps the outer shell of the Maru swords. Maru swords are forged with one metal, as you know. This sword was forged with, I couldn't tell you the specifics, it's on Jiro's site, um, but it's, it's there. But it's a single piece of steel, it's a little taller, and the reason is that is it helps it work into heavier targets. Now, let's move on to the next stage. The next lamination jump, which would be San Mai. This is my Higo. This was the last Higo forged and made by Chitness Incorporated which is here in sunny California. Actually, it's up some ways. It's in San Diego. Now, Chetness forged this blade with a 9260 edge and a 1045 wrap, which means there's an outer shell of 1045 around that edge of 9260 steel. 9260 is very edge retained. You know, it retains its edge very well. It keeps the blade. It's very flexible. It's a good steel to use, and Chetnis use it in their 926-year line. The other one, Tenchi, is known as a great heavy target sword, and this has the same kind of height as you saw on the Hanabira. Now, what makes this Higo different is it actually uses it that laminated method. I have not yet seen another company or seller use that steel in a combination with a laminated blade, so it was, that's what initially drew me to it, and they weren't making it. This was their last one they made. It actually had some problems. The defects were in it didn't have a great polish. The Suba has some blemishes in its patina. That's about it. So I got it for even less than it even shows on their site. But this is the last one they had. Sorry if anybody else wants one, but the Tenchi is just as good. Probably even better in some ways. Now this sword has a bohai, and this is specifically a training bohai. I use this sword for practicing swings, but because it's a laminated sword as well as a little bit more heavier metal, it keeps in with the weight of what I'm used to. So when I grab the Hanabira, which is what I use for medium targets, I switch between these two swords, training, you know, work blade. Now, why would this Bohai help in training? Well, this type of groove pattern, as you can see, if I can get it into the video, <laughs> um, this type of groove pattern goes the whole length of the blade. When you do a striking cut like this, the angle of which you cut creates a different sound, a whoosh. And that sound reflects at how good of an angle you're using. So you can actually use that sound to reference how good of a cut you're doing. So if you did a really good cut and you can remember that sound, you just keep practicing until you get that muscle memory into play. Now see, I have a bad habit when I'm using my swords. I'm ambidextrous, so I'll switch from doing a lefty to a righty, lefty to a righty. And you'll notice in some of my cutting videos, I'll actually put my right foot forward and I'm striking from the left side. That's because I've been cutting the other way and I just was trying to do it less one. It's a bad habit. I, it's, I really should just stick to one type of blood cutting, but I try to vary it up. Now, what makes this one lighter? When you do this type of bohai, it reduces weight, but due to the thickness and overall weight of the metals, this blade is roughly the same as a standard sword. It's, it's more so heavy than the Ujifusa, but it's still if I can get the two roughly equivalent, a little longer as you can see. A little thicker, a little longer. Not keeping up with what we know as a standard Japanese jump. Hello and welcome to part two. Now, we're going to go into the next stage, which these are the higher laminated blades. I'm actually shooting the ego if anybody cares. Um, what we're going to bring in is what is replacing my Kazu no Kami Soraya, which is a sword I've had for years. I've used it. I've worked it. It's been polished so many bloody times. It's just, it's been retired. Now, I needed a sword that can keep up with it, but I want one that was stronger, but kept in line what I'm used to with that sword. That sword was my initial light target blade. Now, I wanted a medium sword, but I didn't want to get rid of what I'm used to, if that makes sense, my friends. So. Here is the Ujifusa, and above it is the Destroyer of Fate. Yes, even in, even more so pretentious name for my Shizo Zume laminated swords. Both of them always seem to have pretentious names. This one was actually named by you, the subscribers, who helped me on my Facebook. Um, I put up a poll, people suggested names, we all got together. 
And basically, the end result was Haikaisha no Ume, which means the destroyer of fate. And this sword was, is our second project sword, the Demon Sword Tube. As our first one is our, actually the highest tier blood you can probably get for what it is. Let me just say it for what it is, okay? This sword is supposedly reflective of Japanese methods, both geometry, edge style, and design. This sword is made in China. Now, before you guys pick up your pitchforks and torches, put them down. Just calm down. Tsunami Tiger Forge, which is an eBay seller, took the commission to make this blade. This blade is designed to be heirloom quality, while be completely combat functional. So it is what it is, right? Now, if we compare this to the Ujifusa, as well as, like, say, the Higo. One of the things that will jump out at you right off the bat is roughly, and get these two aligned, is it's actually a little thinner here than the Higo. The sheath is a little thinner, and if you can't really see it in the video, but this part of the sheath on the Destroyer Fate is actually a lot thinner. It tapers off. It's a little more width, a little less wood. So, it's already been styled and shaped better than a $200 sword. Now granted that one's like a $400 sword, but I only bought the Higa for $200, so I'm just keeping it in what I paid for it. But I will reflect how much it's really worth. Now this sword, as a project sword, is a high tier blade designed with Shizuzume Laminason. Same as my Kaze no Kami Soraya. More so though, it, it has a little more engineering. Now what do I mean by that? Let's, let's pull out this sword. Since getting this, this blade has actually been almost perfect to draw, but as all blades, it's got some breaking. I need to use it more. I've only used it three times in the cutting. Now, granted, I've got a medium and a light target with it. I've shown a light target. My mediums, I do myself. And that's with, you know, thicker bamboo shoots. I slowly get thicker and thicker and thicker and see where it, when it starts to have a little issue, that's where I kind of go, okay, that's the limit of that blade. I should not go past this. Granted, I tend to, and that's how I break swords. Now, right off the bat, my friends, you should notice something pretty interesting. The blade is almost the same length. Still a little longer because it was made for me, remember, I'm tall. But the actual shaping perfectly overlays. Now, this sword was not designed after this one. This sword by Tsunami Tiger Forge was designed after a Muramasa sword. Let that sink in. It was designed after the infamous demon swords of Japan. The fact that this Ujifusa reflects that is actually very easily explained. The Ujifusa, the smiths, actually used, I found out, Muramasa school techniques to design their blades. So, handy trick. Real differences, though, as you can probably see, is this actually has a Muramasa bohai. Now, you're probably wondering, what does that do? How does that help the blade? It reduces a little weight near the middle. Now, if you're not familiar with using a sword in Ido or combat function, you really only strike with this part of the blade. This part doesn't take the hit. If you're doing for quick chop attacks, you want to hit roughly in that area. Do not aim for the tip, this little edge point where the two edge taper up. That's actually the weakest part of your sword. Let me repeat that. That part of the Kisaki tip is the weakest part. Now, this is a five metal laminated sword. Okay, it perfectly, I want to say that it perfectly reflects the Japanese geometry. So that's as close as I've seen a sword in Japan comparable to my Ujifusa and my Kaze no Kamesureya. The fact that it's supposed to be replacing my Kaze no Kamesureya makes it perfect for me, in all honesty. It fits what I needed to do. Now, with the bohai there, it actually reduces the weight, but because of the Muramasa bohai style, it actually adds a little more forward weight, allowing for good chops and even in a medium target. This is using folded steel, forge, a little less, you can actually see the folds. Now those folds act as a shock you know, a shock absorbing system. When you strike down, it's going to take weight going forward, you know, impact going forward a lot better 
than just a straight maro. It acts as cushions, as you will. Light, medium, and heavy, harder, I'm sorry. Soft, medium, and harder metals are merged together. It's got an iron core and a 1095 edge. And 1095, T10, and Tabahangade are all roughly equivalent in how they perform. Granted, this one also has silver parts, and it has its name engraved in it. Ujifusa. <laughs> Just joking. Destroyer of Fate. Now, let's move on onto the highest tier possible. What do I mean? This is a heavy target blade. This is a blade that is our first project sword. By the way, my Haikai Shino Ume to forge costs $1,800, as I stated. Tsunami Tiger is actually making replicas of my blade and it will be selling 22 of them for roughly $2,222. As I said, it's a higher tier heirloom quality blade. And as it compares to our initial sword pretty well, you know, take that as you will. This is its big brother, Nanamioni, the Seven Eyed Demon. This sword terrifies people, FYI, at the dojo. I mean, I draw that people back up, and I don't know what it is about the sword other than it's a black steel polish. Now, as you compare it to the polishing, you notice it's a darker steel up above. It's a little harder outer shell. This is a Soshu Kite laminated sword, the highest level lamination. Seven metals merged together. Along with that, its shaping doesn't have any bohai or weight reduction techniques, as the Sanmai lamination is already a, a weight reduction method. The seven metals use lighter metals, medium metals, and hard metals in multiple stages. Light metal core, medium metal outer core, with a hard metal shell and edge. So it's like a layer, an edge, a layer, a core. Okay? Now, this is also a Datanuki, which is torso cutter design. This was made by Ronan Katana and it's designed to be simple, elegant, crafted by, uh, I'm trying to remember who did it. Tontail Customs did the setup. Josiah Boomershine did the polish. That's a beautiful blade. Now, I do want to come clean. I have damaged it. Right about there, you can see there's a little micro nick when I cut through multiple hard targets. This sword is ridiculous in performance. I just want you to know that. That's the only thing I've ever done to script this sword. Now, it's a minor nick, and what do you do with that? It's common with harder target swords. Harder target swords are actually very hard to keep in shape. You have to polish them all the time, and, you know, you work around it. You polish it, you clean it, polish it, you clean it, you just get rid of all the nicks. Most swords and harder targets will have a lot of nicks in them, sorry to say. This one's going to eventually probably be beat up and retired. But the seven metals actually make it lighter than this sword. It's actually really well balanced. So now that we've gone through the stages, we'll proceed on with the next Cheap vs. Real, Episode 8. So that'll come at a later point. So thanks for watching, and I hope this video has helped you learn a little more, my friends.